Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of the British Esports Esports Show. This is episode three of season two. Uh, welcome and I hope you all enjoy this exciting show that we've got for you today. Of course, I am joined by Bryony as always. Bryony, how have you been? You didn't have me last time. You were here with Billy. How did that go? I know. We missed you, but it, it was good. I say we had we had a lot of fun um, and looking forward to seeing what women in esports stuff we can do in the future. But we did miss you. Oh, that's nice. I missed you too. I was watching on in the distance like, oh. <laughs> um, brilliant. So this time it is back to, to you and me. Uh, and interestingly, this time we're not joined just by one guest. We're joined by two very special guests. Today it's very esports production focused. And so that we thought who better to bring on than our own Elliot and Chris, uh, aka the Sunderland. How are you both doing? Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So if you want to just very quickly introduce yourselves, I guess uh, Chris will start with you, uh, just who you are, what you do, and uh, why you think esports production is super cool. God, that last bit's a lot harder than the beginning bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm Chris, the Sunderland, like you said. Um, I specialize in technical directing and producing streams primarily esports although not exclusively um and why i think what was the end question why i think esports production's really cool why do you enjoy it why do i think oh, why, do I, why do i enjoy it i enjoy it because i love video games and i love the ability to work in a space that i've loved throughout my life right like so like video games are a large part of my childhood me and my dad bonded over them a lot when i was younger and the fact that i can work in an industry video game focused is amazing oh yeah over to you <laughs> I was just waiting for the for the for the uh, for the production to tell me to go. You see, <laughs> not my job today. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Elliot. I'm also a producer. I don't specialize in anything. I'm a jack of all trades kind of guy. Um, in fact, uh, that picture that you've got in the middle of the screen right now, I was literally standing just to the right there behind those behind those chaps sitting down. Um, but yes, I. Um, I love I love production. It is probably the most favourite part of my job. I have a very varied job within British esports, so uh, it, this esports production is is something that I do find most exciting and thrilling, and it is always a good time. Uh, the people that I get to work with are amazing, um, especially Chris. Look at him, oh. happy chappy. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, 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 and and particularly, I think what really makes it cool is when I'm demonstrating it to people who have no idea what production is. And they're just like, whoa! Look at all the look at all the sliders, <laughs> look at all the look at all the things that you can do. And I'm like, yep, I can do all these things. <laughs> so that's what makes it cool. I relate so hard to that. I've yeah. never heard anyone describe it, but yeah, showing somebody how a production works is mind blowing to them, and like so simple to me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So our first segment of the podcast, and um, we're going to get to know a little bit more about you, your role, and even more coverage on your favourite things about the roles. So we will now start the rundown. Either either of you can start um, with these questions. It's not targeted for either of you at either time, but we'll start off nice and simple. Um, how did you get started in esports? Whoever wants to do you, first. Do you want to take it first, Elliot? Oh, okay, right. okay. It looks like I'm taking it first. Yeah, you go, you go. Okay, so I was halfway through my degree in computer science playing Rocket League in a community stream, having a lot of fun, met some really nice people there, still know a lot of them, like a fair amount of my friends still come from that community. And they were trying to put on streams for their community. And at, at the time, I think I was still playing on my PlayStation, so I didn't even have a PC or anything. And they... I upgraded to my PC and I was loving it. And they they were still looking for streamers because community, they're always like, there's an influx and outflux of people all the time because trying to hold on to people that are going to volunteer is really hard. Um, and when this next wave of adverts came out for it, I was like, you know what? I think I could do that. I've, I've got internet, a PC. That's all that the requirements said. And so I started helping out there. Um, after a month or so of that, another community organization that I was sort of related to tangentially through this original community reached out and they wanted to 
asking me for my help as well. And I was like, yeah, sure. And then through them, I made other contacts and then somebody started paying me for it. I'm like, <laughs> I, I can get paid for this. This is brilliant. Um, so I started working for these on a semi-regular basis and then a big event came up and I had made so many contacts throughout the community that I was the first name that came to people's minds and they jumped on, they asked me to do it and it just kept growing and growing from there. And it was brilliant. I've had, yeah, no official training, but you pick a lot up really quickly if you're paying attention, I think. And so, yeah, that's, that's how I got started. And Elliot? I can relate to quite a lot of those stories, apart from the bit about where people pay me. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I didn't start from a community or a game or anything. I obviously was working for British Esports at the time. Um, we already, already always had plans to stream lots of content and lots of games. Um, but because the team was quite small, um, and particularly because there was a lot of other stuff going on and we were still kind of evolving and growing as an organization at the time, those plans were like further ahead and we hadn't, you know, they were, they were in the pipeline, so to speak. Then the pandemic hit and it was like, right, all of those plans got accelerated quite, quite quickly. Um, and instead of, instead of, you know, taking a sort of reasonable approach of let's hire somebody who knows what they're doing, it was, I'm going to go learn what to do. In, you know as fast as possible and we're going to just start doing it and we're going to start doing it next week kind of deal um so it was a bit of a rocky start from me throwing thrown in the deep end really a test of faith oh well played yeah thank you uh, but um yeah very much enjoyed that side of things and, and how kind of it was a, a, a trial by fire uh, because i like to think we did all right and i like to think i'm pretty good at it now and as i, I can i can echo what chris just said you know you I, I have had some official training, but not until way after I did my trial by fire. You know, I, I learned all the basics first the hard way by, by myself and then took some training afterwards. So, uh, yeah. Ah, that's really interesting. So I guess kind of linking to that and talking about the, the kind of skills that you learn, obviously you didn't like learn it in, the, in a more traditional way, like in school or whatever, but you did pick up these skills kind of yourself. Um, what kind of skills are required, do you think, or that are really important for esports production what kind of things do you need to be doing or knowing in order to at least get started perhaps what do you think uh chris we'll start with you well for me i think a lot of the skills aren't that difficult especially when you're starting out and you're working with simpler events a lot of it is just making sure you're doing everything right there's a lot going on all at the same time and it's very easy that something gets lost like you you have a camera that's slightly out of position or slightly unfocused or slightly miscolor corrected. You have a slight audio desync last night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. There, there's so much going on that it's not necessarily about knowing what to do because I don't find that's particularly hard. I find a lot of it is very obvious and very almost like logical as to go through everything, but it's to go every go through everything in your system you, you might have like four cams four audio speakers you want to make sure all the audio is balanced well which is actually one of the harder skills i think is finding audio levels to be done correctly um but just keeping your eye on everything all at once and also knowing you've got to change from scene to scene and then you hit the next scene and uh, that's when you realize that you've you've missed a thing and you've got to fix that right now the ability to adapt on the fly as quickly as you can is also super important. Yeah, so as soon as uh, as soon as you asked that question, Spyro and I started like writing stuff down that I think right these are the important things. So I didn't forget them, and I'm literally looking at my list there, and, and pretty much most of them uh, Chris just mentioned, but I'll, I'll read the ones. In. So first off, yeah, attention to detail is the number one absolute skill you must have, and I and even Chris will tell you even even I am like very over the top with it. Uh, I don't think you're over the top. I think that there's there's an importance to it, and it's the difference between somebody running a stream and a big organization having a good product out there. That's it. Yeah. So if you if you want to have like you know something that looks good and is professional and is smart, and nobody's going to pick apart because believe me they will, mm -hmm. right? Uh, then you've got to pay attention to the detail. Uh, timing is another big one that's quite important. That I don't think Chris mentioned. Um, you know. 
making sure that you are sticking to schedule, making sure that things don't under, overrun or underrun, you know, making sure that the people who are in charge of timing, I, whoever it may be, a host or a video segment, if somebody's coming in afterwards, then they know that they've got however many seconds left before they're now on screen or whatever that may look like. Uh, reaction, yeah, being able to react and adapt on the fly, like, like Chris said. Problem solving is another quite a big one because there's, there are quite a few problems in, uh, in, in production generally, especially when you're learning on the job. Um, and, and I find that being able to kind of, you know, troubleshoot what, what steps you've taken to recreate that problem so that you can order to fix it is quite a big, uh, quite a big skill to have. So if the, the better you are at problem solving, the better you are going to be at production. Same for like kind of logical thinking, um, like, right, does this make sense in this, you know, common sense, right? It's, it's a very underrated tool and an underrated value in people. And I think that it goes hand in hand really with kind of problem solving. So if you have one, you kind of tend to have the other. So I'd say that, that, and then the only thing that Chris didn't mention as well is just to test, test and test again, like literally testing all the time. Run as many, as many fake broadcasts as you need to run as many, you know, get you, get you, if you need, if you need four volunteers for four cameras, get your friends in and do it the night before, you know, to make sure it all works. So yeah, yeah. lots of testing. So just jump on the end of that hundred percent testing. Um, I often find that almost, especially if it's not something rec that's recurring, a job will take as much time in prep as it will in actually doing the job, if not more, just to make sure everything works properly. Yeah, if you if you pre yeah, if you've prepped and you know that you've spent more time on it than the actual segment, then you're probably going to be all right. More well, nine times out of ten, anyway. Awesome. So um, I know you guys sort of touched on it in your first answer, <laughs> um, but what equipment and software? would you sort of recommend for someone who wants to produce a stream whether that you could range it from beginners to more of a professional sort of level up to you so chris um starting out you need a pc with a <laughs> decent graphics card and that's about it honestly uh you can get really far with just those very simple elements um but I've worked in environments where we have a 15 PC setup, also taking the feeds directly from six more players. And we've got this going on and this going over here. There's so much sound audio tech that I couldn't even begin to get into. There is video capture devices. Like everyone knows Elgato, right? It's the big stream thing. You get your stream decks and your cap cards all from Elgato. You can go so far beyond that. It's unreal. I've, I've been in environments where we've got little decimators. I didn't even know what decimator was. So I started hooking one up to something to pull an SDI feed, which is another thing that people just won't realize even exists because it's not a, a visual standard that the consumer tends to use. Um, beyond that, I think learning how to use a stream deck and the applications as, uh, attached to it will, I don't, I don't think they're necessary, but they definitely streamline processes in your job that will make your life a lot less mentally demanding whilst working like you can you can be sure that a button will do something and having having assuming you've tested it as elliot said <laughs> um you'll, you'll be sure that that button is going to do exactly what you want it to do and it'll start and everything will go well um but i don't think there's a lot in terms of equipment that you need to have to start at the base level um sorry come on <laughs> uh, that's right so i should have waited for the prompt you see that's what, that's what production's all about um i would agree with a lot of that um i would also say processor is heavy I, I use quite a lot of processing power when i'm using when i'm streaming and actually if you haven't got the strongest graphics card but you have got the strongest processor like you can lean quite you know you can lean on one or the other depending on what system you're using and depending on what software you're using as well I tend to lean quite heavily on my processor because my graphics card is from 2017. So um, <laughs> there are some third world problem, uh, first world problems right there. <laughs> Sorry, it's I, dis morning. I disagree slightly with that, just because, especially when we're talking esports production, you probably have a game running somewhere as well. That's and true. so I don't find that processing is nearly as important as having a GPU because video games, especially modern ones, are very reliant on graphics cards over CPUs. 
So I, I would actually disagree with that, even though from a production standpoint, you're technically correct. Okay. If you're starting out, that's not necessarily true because you'll have to be one man warrioring a lot oh, yeah, of your true. jobs. Was, and... was the question about starting out? So maybe I, I maybe don't I know. I, I, I just I felt like you dis- disagreed with me. <laughs> well, a, I want to fight my corner. First podcast debate here. So oh. it, it wouldn't be a podcast if we didn't have a disagreement with me and Chris on it. What we like? That's what we like. Um, yeah, processor and memory, but yeah, fine. That's a very valid point. Um, yeah, we will need decent graphics, especially if you are one man banding it and you are running a game in the background because that obviously consumes a lot of graphical uh, graphical power. Uh, I went from uh, a software called Streamlabs, Streamlabs OBS. Look at his face. <laughs> <laughs> right so that was that was the very first program i learned on then i switched to obs then i switched to vmix and having used vmix i will never ever use any other streaming program ever again um it's just literally that good it's it's that powerful it's got that many tools and you can do pretty much anything you want on it um with ver- with varying ease you know like very very easily it doesn't bug um there are presets that you can bundle up for people like for example the, the streams that the Sunday lad does for us at British Esports, you know, I'll build them and then I'll just package them and send them over to him and it's there in 30 seconds and he can just load the whole lot up and it's ready to go. Um, to be fair, I don't often do that. Um, he's, he's pretty good at sorting it out himself. But um, the other thing I would use, you know, I have a stream deck. I have, uh, in fact, I have an Elgato. It is right here. I don't think it's plugged in. It's only the little one. Oh, no, it is plugged in. Definitely. Plugged in. Um, but I also have the, the phone app. Um, that I used oh, right at the beginning days. So you can get the little phone app that basically acts as a stream deck, does exactly the same stuff. And it has, you know, your multiple buttons on your phone. Um, but you, you can, and you can get that for free. So, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty good at producing stuff now that it is kind of for like high end users, middle end users, and, and low end users, you know, for in terms of, of budget and cost and, and, and availability and accessibility. So, um, if, yeah, if, you, if you're struggling, if you're just starting out, you know, Stream decks are great. You don't need them, right? It's a fancy thing to have. I, I, I hardly ever use mine unless there are like some particularly things I'm worried about, or I want to make sure that the stuff I'm doing is streamlined uh, when I'm, you know, while I'm multitasking. That's another thing actually that you need to be good at multitasking. Anyway. Oh yeah. Why is that? <laughs> why is that? Yeah. Why do you need to be good at multitasking? Okay. Fine. I'll go into detail. Right. So I'm. Let's say I'm producing. Um, I've got. Uh, a show match going on there are two teams playing in that show match i'm coordinating with the teams coordinating with the admins who are running that game Uh, i'm also coordinating with all of the broadcast teams so that's you know whoever's on camera at the time whoever's about to be on camera at the time i need to be telling people that their audio is safe or is not you know whether it's live on on air or not Uh, and then anything else that's going on i if anybody wants to talk to you who's not in that space um you know will probably be messaging you on various platforms (laughs) You've got to be watching Twitch chat or YouTube chat or whatever chat it is, you know, to make sure that everything looks right uh, and people aren't telling you that there's a sound problem that you can't hear. Or and things they like will that. be. And they will be. <laughs> yes. The thing about Twitch chat, they love to tell you when you get it wrong. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's literally, I mean, that's just off the top of my head, but there is tons of stuff that goes on and I'm constantly, constantly multitasking all the time. You made a good point. I completely forgot about software in that question. Um, I think you've heavily underestimated the power of OBS, but you have Shout to use OBS, it well. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not, defense, no, no, no. Vmix my, is better. I agree. Defense, I didn't use I didn't use OBS for that long. Um, I, I was I was Streamlabs for about seven to nine months. Streamlabs like doesn't that. count. Okay, then I went to OBS and I was on OBS for about four months, and then I switched to Vmix. So in my defense, I didn't actually get to experience the full breadth and width of of OBS in its full glory. The best part of OBS is the amazing community behind yeah, it. The there mo- are plugins for everything, and those plugins make it arguably the best streaming software in the world. But just because, not not because of how good it is, but because how of how good it can be with the use of everything that the, the community. OBS stands for Open Source Broadcast Software, right? And the open source is the best part of that. We're talking about vMix. vMix can do basically everything, but that's what it can do. Like it's locked in. You can't add more stuff to it. vMix is pretty much a built-in package. Streamlabs, 
has got issues with over bloating because they have more packages in that you will ever need and they're always trying to sell you things and other things um whereas obs is a clean install and you just add exactly what you need as you're going and there really is so much out there for it and it can be optimized in so many ways like i'm, I'm seeing Saul is doing obs on this today right correct this is how it's run yeah and there are things in there that i he's shown me this morning already that i'd be like this is how i would do that in vmix <laughs> but it's not intuitive yeah, I, and yeah. I, I love i love seeing it it's good yeah the very little experience i've had of, of like production stuff i guess mainly through doing just like solo streams and that kind of stuff but being able to mess with obs it's always one of my favorite parts it's like oh how can i do something yeah. a bit more exciting i'll make it look a bit more interesting and so i love playing around with all that kind of stuff it's really fun um so moving on a little bit then to opportunities so when i think of how to get maybe started or how to get those opportunities i know chris you kind of talked about it a little bit when you were saying how you got started um i think one of the ways most people i assume could get the grips with streaming or with production is just by streaming themselves and kind of having that go and just messing around like you said and trying things and trialing things testing things um but then further from that how does someone go from doing it themselves in their own time to perhaps doing it with a team how, how can they get that and find those opportunities um or what kind of advice would you offer to people looking for opportunities to be able to do bigger production scale things i am always going to boast the importance of grassroots and community and again grassroots community is one of the easiest ways to get into a team to get hands-on experience with actual things um there is also a market at the moment i'm seeing for putting on small level show matches between whoever in a, a certain title and hosting it on your own platform uh, be it twitch youtube whatever uh, i'm seeing a lot of people growing themselves that way also making a name for themselves that way and in that way they, they're growing more than just their skills but also their name which i think is super impressive i, lo I love seeing that i've got a friend in uh, sub-saharan africa who's doing some amazing stuff right now and He's all self. He's a fifty-year-old guy doing Rocket League stuff, and he's he's got the best story to me because he knew nothing five years ago. He picked up a video game, and now he's so invested. He loves it so much, and he's doing everything he possibly can with it. I think it's brilliant. Um, it's and apart from play. that, it is a hundred percent right. What a guy. Um, for real. Um, apart from that, it's. You got to make friends with the right people and i was very fortunate to do that um i only know elliot through another elliot and i know that elliot through another couple of friends and this commu community is just amazing if you've got a video game you're passionate about as well i would heavily recommend trying to develop your skills in that video game in, in a grassroots situation elliot what do you think um good points well made uh this has always been always been the way in esports. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And I don't necessarily think that applies in production though. I think production is very much a case of you can just you can literally just try and do it. You know, there's there's nothing stopping you at all other than your hardware. And you know, you might not necessarily enjoy being the streamer, but you must you might enjoy doing the stream, if that makes sense, right? So I started out doing, you know, um, a lot more content when I was on on the camera, you know, front facing content. Um, and that didn't, you know, I'm not saying I don't like doing it. I just don't want to do it all the time. Okay. And if I was a streamer, I wouldn't want to be doing, you know, three streams a week or four streams a week or whatever it looks like, you know, to be a full time streamer or whatever. But the production side of it, I just, you know, fell in love with and it's fantastic. Uh, opportunities come around. They do. There's constantly people in need for um, for production. Um, I'm part of several, you know, different Discord servers that are basically recruitment servers. You know, that have people who've worked on stuff in the past, and as soon as there's a job going, they go ping. Right, this group. This is the job. This is the game. This is the time we need you. This is the hours, and this is whether it's paid or not. You know, and and those are the those are the kind of opportunities that are available. I'm not going to say what those servers are, uh, but there are loads of them, right? And and I know this because I've you know I've been invited to some, I've left others. You know, they're 
people are just crying for you know for for work now i could be in those servers through my connections at british esports i don't really know but i very much doubt it because i don't really have a social handle as you could probably tell there's no <laughs> as you can tell at, the elliot bond there's, <laughs> no, there's no at elliot I, I don't use social media never have done so i can't put it down to social media success uh you can't put it down to my personal streaming because i don't personally stream um i do it just through the odd occasions I've worked on British esports and people I've met uh, and the, the kind of servers that I'm in uh, about video games, about, you know, people who run events, you know, those, it, it, I'm, I'm a fan of people who put stuff on. And by being in those circles, I occasionally get to hear about or see opportunities. Is that, I think that, that kind of makes sense. Um, so the biggest one is the easiest and obvious one. It's, you know, Twitch is a free platform. Uh, so is YouTube, so is Facebook gaming if you're that way inclined, right? And you can just go online and do it. There's, there's nothing to stop you. Uh, and, it, and if you don't like the front, the, you know, the camera front facing, there's all this new stuff as well. You know, there's, there's animation, there's VTubing, you know, the, the kind of virtual side of things that it doesn't necessarily have to put you front facing. You don't have to be the entertainer anymore, right? You, you know, you can let the game or let... The, your programs be the entertainment for you and i know a guy who who's got i mean to be fair he is quite front facing but he's got like you know 90 plus interactable redeems on his channel you know you can you can do anything in his channel from like make his print a print out picture that you've drawn to fire a nerf gun from the other side of the room at his face right while he's live on camera like he you know he he doesn't need to entertain you anymore because the amount of redeems he has you entertain yourself just by playing playing around with them, you know, and having fun, like shooting him with stuff and, you know, whatever it may look like. So I think it's just about uh, having a go, really, seeing what, what you like and what you don't love, uh, like about it. And then once you've figured out that, you know, uh, you, you can kind of put yourself out there in terms of uh, introductions, in terms of making friends, like Chris said. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, getting some opportunities within some circles. Voluntary work is always good. People love voluntary work. Uh, it's always risky to pay somebody, especially for a live content, without seeing what they can do beforehand. So you're going to need to get yourself a portfolio of some degree, you know, you've, so at least something you can showcase. Either that or work with them, you know, for free first uh, so that they can see what you like, what you're good at, what you're not good at. Um, Chris is a bit of a different story because he actually he's part of a company, so you expect the company to actually d d deliver on a. Project. I did a I did a lot of volunteer work before before any of that though. Like yeah, I'm there now 100. percent But I think I was broadcasting for eight months before the first gig pay came around before yeah. I actually got paid for anything. So 100 percent volunteering or growing your portfolio like you said which i like to do in a grassroots scene because then you're supporting communities whilst not giving companies free work um which i think is the best way to do that without being taken advantage of mm -hmm. um but apart from that i completely agree with you awesome so it's gonna be we want um realism we want opinions we like debate and things so i know we spoke about briefly at the start of the podcast what your favorite part of esports production and what makes it so cool but in reality what's your least favorite part about esports production we'll go to chris first yeah talent 100 percent talent talent are awful they <laughs> suck they can't listen to simple instructions they can't turn up on time. They have massive egos. They never think they're wrong. Talent is the worst part of esports production. Anyone you see on screen probably sucks. And I mean that in a mostly jokey way. Um, a lot of the people I work with are amazing and I love them. But just the other day, I had a very important broadcast where two of the casters went away to the bathroom during a break and took like eight minutes. There was a two minute break and they took eight minutes to come back. Uh, I'm stood there like, what what can i do well, the thing is starting the, the the next segment has begun we have to go to it we're going to cover it with this over here but <laughs> talent suck <laughs> and elliot talent <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> 
Um, yeah, to be honest, it's not. But yeah, it's the people that you're relying on to be on screen. Not necessarily always the talent. Could also be the players. Could also that's be, a great point. Could also be the organizers of those players, like the team manager or the staff member or whatever it is. Yeah, the talent can be quite frustrating to work with. Uh, I, I've I've felt your pain, Chris, on the on the toilet break uh, scenario multiple times. The egos as well is quite a big one. Um, although I have less, I think, experience with that than you per se. But it's been an interesting ride over the last couple of years to you know witness different because I've worked with loads of different talents come in and out. Um, Chris, you've mostly worked in the Rocket League, so you forgive me for wrong. I know you've done quite a lot more elsewhere it's as fine. well, but those are that's the majority of your talents, Rocket League talent, right? Yep. Um, so we have lots of different talent across different titles, um, and I don't think it changes. They're, they're the same in every game. <laughs> um, so yeah, can can be can be um, quite uh, what's the word mischievous uh, and also disobedient. Now, I'm not saying that I'm, you know, I'm running the ship like a captain and I'll make you walk the plank if you do something wrong. But, you know, there is a degree of you kind of need to follow my instructions if we're going to have a good broadcast, right? So very, very, very basic stuff. But, I mean, that's, that's probably the, the thing I dislike the most about uh, Actually, it's not that I don't even like it, dislike it the most. The thing I dislike the most is audio. Now, Chris oh, touched yeah, on okay. earlier. The first, the first two years of my of broadcasting... Uh, and I'll just be open and honest here. Audio was just a complete bodge, right? Like I just bodged it like a bad plumber, you know, because I just made it work and it worked and I don't know how it worked or why it worked, but it did. And that got the job done. Uh, now I know what, you know, what I'm doing to some degree with, with audio. Um, it's a lot easier uh, and I made sure my systems are a lot cleaner. But in, especially in the first, you know, learning audio was just, was so hard for me personally. I don't know whether it's hard for everybody. Some people might just pick it up in a flash, but I really struggled with it. Uh, it's fiddly, it's finicky, it goes wrong all the time, and people love to complain about it. So... I think I think you have to have an ear for it. I think you have to have like, a, there's just this innate knack for that problem because I, or if you'd asked me 18 months ago, two years ago, I probably would have said audio. I've had a lot of bad talent experience and I've gotten a lot better at understanding how audio works in the last like two years. But before that, if you'd asked me this question, I probably would have said audio because <laughs> it, it, it doesn't make any sense. They're both up there, aren't they? Audio and talent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think over time it skews towards talent. <laughs> Just because understanding gets better, you start to be better at your job. You've worked more on it. Yeah. That, that's another thing. Like you just, yeah, you the more you work, audio. the less. You can't improve talent. <laughs> <laughs> the, the more you work, the less problems you'll have. Not because the problems are any harder or easier, but because you understand them better and you've bumped into this before and you know what you're dealing with. So like, I, I think as time goes on, these things become less and less true, but talent don't get better. Uh, Which been... is not to say this has been some very broad stroke. Sorry, Saul. No, sorry. Uh, this has been some very broad stroke generalization. There are some amazing, very consistent people, and even in my position, right, there are people in my jobs that don't that, that arguably are worse than some of the talent we work with. And oh yeah, there's, there's, there's inconsistent there. broadcasters and, and producers as well as talent. Like let's 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 not just lump it all in talent here. Talent includes everybody behind the scenes, but mostly we're talking about the people who are front-facing cameras yeah yeah i think i find that a lot in uh in the video editing side of things as well it's not always necessarily the the things i guess that you can control it's like all oh, the the transitions the cuts and everything you can do it's the video that you're given if the video that you're given isn't right then it's like oh well i guess i'm stuck with this now so yeah i, I feel the pain of that <laughs> a little bit um just to wind down a little bit then and kind of finish on this um Obviously, you've, you've both worked on different kinds of broadcasts, some of the smaller scale stuff like student champs, but then some bigger scale stuff outside of that. What are some of the differences between the smaller and the bigger scale uh, productions and, and what kind of things should people keep in mind if they're wanting to do this on a more regular basis, on a more professional basis? That kind of that scaling up, what does scaling up look like and what things should people keep in mind? So I'm going to answer. Oh, yeah, sure. Only because you've got the bigger answer. So I'm just going to be very brief on mine. <laughs> Um, I would just say paying attention to time zones is really important. I've worked with, worked with people in 
America, in Europe, you know, across the globe in, in various different time zones. And we are, I'm here, you know, we're here in the UK and we have a very confusing time zone system, um, especially when you look at the rest of the world, how easy, you know, it is. Uh, but with, you know, we've got daylight savings and et cetera, et cetera. It, just make sure you pay attention to time zones and call times and make sure you're there on time. Uh, don't don't be that guy uh, and and ask, right? Because if, if you don't know, just make sure you know. Like, even if you have to ask four different people to figure out what time it is in whatever country you're needed. Um, but yeah, over to you, Chris. Uh, just to end on that one real quickly. Um, I would heavily recommend asking for Discord timestamps because that's a yeah. thing that exists or Google Meet calendars or whatever to lock down exactly when that is for your time zone. I have made time zone mistakes once and it didn't affect me because the event got postponed by two hours. And it was only, I was only an hour out, so I was fine. But time zones are so messy. Um, there, there are like eight different time zones that you can tell me and I'll know what time it is there now just because of how much i spent making sure i didn't <laughs> now, actually on my personal discord server we do have clocks at the top so that we know what the time is in different <laughs> things we're having to look it up um but i'm gonna answer this question in two parts one remote and one in person um the smaller scale remote jobs will almost definitely be harder than the larger scale remote jobs because smaller scale doesn't have budget they don't have a massive support network and so you'll end up doing a lot more of the job than you'd think you'll have to be the in-game observer a lot of the time as well as the producer as well as the audio guy as well as potentially a replay up in the worst scenarios small scale jobs shouldn't have that much expansion but sometimes they ask for it because they don't know what they're doing and that's that's another great point is tos or smaller companies that haven't worked in the esports space a lot don't necessarily know what they're asking when they're asking it, especially in terms of workload. Um, yeah, and agree. a lot of the time they'll try and throw that onto one person because they'll think that that's a doable scenario. And a lot of the time it is, but that doesn't mean it's not a lot of work for that person that does it. And that tends to not be the larger scale events, but the smaller scale events. And when you scale up into larger scale events, you'll be surprised at how much you don't work on your own machine. Again, this is remote, I mean. Um, because I was working at an event, and will be tonight actually, <clears throat> where we're using AWS server machines and everything's off site, and you parsec into them, and you don't have any control over the, the presets all set up. And I feel like those jobs are so much easier because somebody else has gone through and done a lot of the heavy lifting before you start. And all you've got to do is come in and do your job, as opposed to all the prep and everything else that Ellie and I were talking about earlier. In terms of LAN in person scenarios, um, it's mostly the same. There's not a massive jump. I've worked in four person land teams and I've worked in 25 person land teams. And the real major difference is just features. Um, because in effect, when you get to teams that size, you, you stop having like live videos that you have to play and things like that. And you just have a feed from somebody else who's doing that job for you. There's somebody sending you that again, like these things seem to get easier the, the more you get into a higher position because people have got their stuff together. They, they, they know what they're doing better more and they, they tend to be prepared for you. They tend to be ready for you and you come in and they'll, they're especially in a land scenario. There's a lot to do because uh, most of the time you walk in and nothing is ready and everything's on fire. Um, <laughs> But by the time you're actually on production day or production time, if everything's not still on fire, which you really hope it's not, <laughs> um, not to say there won't be fires during the event, um, but a lot of the time it's just take this feed, just take that from the, that person, just press this button because the other person will have offset their work and put it all into you. And so you're, most of the time you're just pressing a button and you'll have an audio guy to sort out audio so Elliot will be happy. And you'll have a graphics guy so that everything that's pretty going on on the screen, not your problem, somebody else. You're just pressing the button to make sure it's on. And the game will be sorted out by somebody else, possibly a couple of people. And so I yeah. think, yeah, it's, it's odd how much easier over time the job gets anyway because you've got more experience, but then also easier because other people just start taking segments of it away from you so you don't have to do it anymore. 
I was going to mention, yeah, so I was literally just about to say, I think there's there's two elements of what you've just said there and you need to break it apart. Like, like okay. One is you're getting better, right, all the time. Every production you do, you're getting better. Even if it's a three-hour boring thing when you only, actually, you, know, you only actually have to do a couple of things, you're still improving, right? The second thing I wanted to say was, uh, yes, people do take stuff away from you, but, you know, everything that, everything that you've done as a... Because like, the problem with production is you don't start learning one thing. You have to learn to do it all, and then you, yeah. you, you specialize in one thing. So if you've done it all, you know, right, yeah, I like, I like doing replay op, or I like doing TO, you know? Um, but like, when, I, when, you know, when, when we work for British Esports, you know, we're the TO, we're the project manager, we're uh, logistics, we're also doing the feed, the game of Zobs. Uh, well, actually, we're not anymore, but we used to, we used to do it all, all in one go. Um, and it's lovely now, you know, to have people who are splitting off in these roles. And even, but to, to, even now we still do it. Like, for instance, I try and have an admin for every game. If, I, if, if an admin's unavailable, I'll get the observer to do it. And I'm sort of shoehorning the observer into two roles there. Not something I particularly like doing, but I know it's possible because I've done those two and six more jobs all by myself before in the past, and I know it's totally fine. So the one man army thing is is fun. You learn a lot faster. Things go wrong a lot more though. Um, but that's okay. You know, it's all all learning process. Um, just I want to go back to like how you were talking about the scaling up from you know that small scale to bigger scale uh, and particularly with uh, Parsec. Just for those of you who don't know what Parsec is, it's just a it's a it's a program that allows you to basically remote control access somebody else's computer. So what Chris is saying there at this point is he's saying they'll have a system that is running the feed and you'll just log into that system. So you don't, you know, you can be on your laptop really, to be honest, or your, your iPad or whatever it is, or your tablet to just log in and, uh, and, and actually operate that system remotely. So therefore you're broadcasting through their specifications. I dislike this. Uh, the reason I dislike this is because whilst it is nice to have somebody hand present you a lovely packaged up, perfect thing that you you know you are not at fault for if it goes wrong because you didn't build it that's the problem you didn't build it so if something does go wrong you can't fix it if something is incorrect you don't know any of the innards of that system or how or how you can fix it i mean you probably can but especially if you're you know fairly new i'd be wary of uh doing parsec especially straight up you know learn what you're doing first before you start remoting into other people's Absolutely. machines um and then, uh, yes, just with the, uh, you know, LAN and particularly bigger scale productions, the, I, I was thinking as you were talking, I was like, it's very much like a kitchen, you know, like, like, like a, if I can That's make a great a, analogy, I can make a burger on my own, right? It'll take me a bit longer, but if I've got, you know, two, sh two three chefs, some guys making the bread for the buns, another guy's like, uh, you know, making the sauce for the burger, another guy's chopping lettuce. You know, and then, you know, I'm there cooking the burger. Like, it's like a well-oiled machine and it all comes together to make this nice restaurant quality burger rather than the two-hour mess that I'd probably end up with, half of it on the floor. Um, so I think that's the difference, really, is, you know, things are faster, it's smoother, it's well-oiled, you've got support if you need it. You know, having this, having this network of people who are all good at all of it um, but are specialising in one thing, you know, you can bounce off people, you can rely on people, uh, and it just makes makes for a smoother smoother process overall. Brilliant. Well, well, thank you so much for your for you guys' uh, input so far. It's been really interesting to hear about kind of the ups and downs of, of esports broadcast and production. Um, very quickly now, we're going to move on to the next segment. Uh, the next segment being the showdown. Um, the showdown this time uh, is going to be a bit interesting because obviously there's four of us. <laughs> uh, so we're going to, we're trying to going to turn it into like a two v two situation. The game we've chosen, or the game I guess technically that you guys have chosen, we've all agreed on, uh, is Crab Game, uh, which everyone I'm sure will still know from the ever top tier esport. Game. Top yeah. tier esport, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, we're going to have a run of that. We're going to play a few games. And basically, because there's two there's two of us on each side, you can't necessarily organize the team games within uh, Crab Game properly. We're going to play, and each person who wins essentially earns points for their team. So I mean, Brian, working on the team against our guests, uh, Chris and Elliot. So let's see how that goes. Stay yeah, on the platforms and don't touch the floor. All right. Wow, 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 wow. 
Right, I don't know who who's got that. Brian, is that you in the little hat? I don't know if you yeah. got a little hat on. Okay. I fell in already. <laughs> oh, you're my teammate. You can't already be no, dead. I'm dying. I, I fell in though. I just I didn't jump. All right. I would recommend not dying this time. Ah no. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Points. Points. Okay. No. Jesus. Ah. Okay, nobody won. Wait, Technically, wait, Chris won. Technically, Chris won. I definitely won. Yes, okay, that's one point. Let's... Let's actually write these down. Oh, my days. Like, oh, but it's slippery. Red oh, light, light, that's cheating. Light. Can I hide behind a tree? Uh, I think you can, actually, yeah. Does it have the weird doll person? It does at the end, yeah. Right. Oh, my God. You have to stop so much. Oh, look at you hiding behind the, the rocks. Where's the red light? It's there. just the, yeah, there you go. The noise that it makes when it turns around. Oh! Well, there's a little thing of pizza on the floor. Oh my days, I'm so fast. <laughs> I'm so far behind. Can you look around when it's looking at you? Uh, I don't know, actually. I don't want to risk it. I've just realised <laughs> there's a sprint button. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, oh, no, who died? <laughs> oh. oh, you can't look around. You can't look around. <laughs> no. Spyron's oh, just got to make point. it to the end. Okay. Come on. Oh. Please. Oh. So dead. oh, I don't like the face. What? I hate that. Go! No! Yes! I, I was literally, I knew because I was watching uh, Spyron's stream of this recording. So I was like, I knew he was right next to me. And I was just going to turn around and push him. But then, <laughs> <laughs> oh. but then uh, uh, turning around shot me. I do love that they've clearly just not updated the game since Christmas. <laughs> Christmas. They've just not bothered to even just take the map off. They bothered to, I mean, that Christmas tree is very without bothering. <laughs> slap something green in the middle of watch the out for the falling platforms and be respectful no pushing no pushing falling platforms okay get ready oh oh my days oh. get into the, the areas with light i did I, not succeed i did not succeed <laughs> oh, i won yeah <laughs> sandy stones okay floor, floor is lava, lava again, again but we're in the ocean okay so the floor is water. The floor, the floor is water, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Two minutes and 20 seconds. Oh, I just totally whiffed the jump. That is dreadful. <laughs> this is not good. This is uh -oh. going real quick. I'm stuck here. Me too. Oh. No! <laughs> oh, the jump. Oh my god, the luck of the draw. I'm wow, not gonna lie, I didn't oh, do. Just, <laughs> oh, right, I've rebounded. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here's a good finale, right? It's stepping stones. Okay. What a one for final points on this. What's this one? It's so, going first. What, oh, right. What is correct? Really one will, will drop you in. Okay. Sunderland's going straight for it. Oh! <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> Briny, carry us through if I die. I'm not sure you even jumped. I don't think I did. Uh, we will ignore that. We both go at the same me. time. Both... <laughs> oh. <laughs> go on, Elliot, make the run. Make the run. Oh, <laughs> look at me. him, look at him. <laughs> no! <laughs> oh, we didn't even make it. <laughs> All that you had to do bad. was not fall in the water. <laughs> yeah. Felt too Does bad. That count? Uh, Definitely I think to, not. I think we have to go again. I think we have no, to go I again. Mean, I did. Go again. I... Yeah. It really likes this game, man. It does. I love Why the tea posing in this game as the characters load in. Can you stop picking my rock? <laughs> Okay, I'm stuck with just two rocks oh, over it. Oh. So, oh! Save me! No! No! no don't, don't push me! Oh, oh my wow. god! Oh, okay. Chris! <laughs> <laughs> yes, Chris! Yes! Okay, right. Oh, that he carries on. He carries on. I think we're all still alive. You came we? on my rock! Are we? 
Saul was on the rock too. No. Nah, he yeah. definitely got oh. pushed off. <laughs> Okay, so we've lost. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> because Due of a unsportsmanlike behaviour. <laughs> unsportsmanlike. The leaderboard is now one host, two guests. Indeed. Damn. Brian. You guys need to get better at video games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what we've learned so far, yeah, over the course of this season yeah. of podcasts. So now, um, it's it's not a podcast without Billy at this point. Um, the wonderful Billy, our women in esports manager. So we're going to pass over to her for all of the women in esports updates for March going into April. Hello, me again with some women in esports updates for the month of March. First of all, I know I mentioned some nominations at the MCV Women in Games Awards last month, but I'm really pleased to say that Bryony picked up the Journalism Impact Awards and Alice picked up the Educational Impact Awards, so huge congratulations to them. Women in Esports Key Pillars and Manifesto has all been released now, so be sure to check that out if you haven't already. It essentially paints the picture for how we envision ourselves going forward. We also kicked off our International Women's Day celebrations this month, which featured a week-long campaign spotlighting and highlighting many different individuals that are killing it in the industry at the moment. And lastly, Bryony and I attended an amazing event in London with Black Twitch UK, who had invited us along to her story in gaming to speak on a panel about women-led initiatives. So thank you so much to Cassie and Danny for inviting us along to that. Some upcoming events for women in esports and British esports. Firstly, we'll be heading to the Bet Show where we can share how schools and universities can be making the most out of esports. We also have our top teams in the Student Champs pilot who have progressed into playoffs. So it'll be really exciting to see how that tournament finishes up. And lastly, we'll see you at i7a as we will be once again heading to Insomnia Gaming Festival. It's been a really busy month for a lot of women in the esports industry this month. I've seen a lot of CSGO women rosters being announced as ESL Impact have started their second season, including G2, Guild and FaZe. Girl Gamer Esports Festival also had their 2023 World Finals in Bahrain. And FIFA have launched a new initiative called Fame Her Game, which is a women esports programme creating opportunities and a safe space for women to compete within their ecosystem, which is actually going to have a global LAN on June the 2nd. So that's another amazing thing to see within the scene. That's all from me for this month. I am super excited to see what April holds out for us. Thanks, Billy. Um, always good to hear from you and what women in esports are up to. So now we're going to move into our almost final segment. And this one is called The Cool Down. So in The Cool Down, we get fans, Twitter, Twitter users. We've got Instagram this time um, to just ask you guys some quick fire questions so the what i like about this just really quickly what i like about this is elliot's lack of social media means that he has zero prep for these questions yeah. no idea. <laughs> there's no way you can prepare for this at all yeah i like it <laughs> so our first question comes from our very own waxen the lovely waxen um, and he asks what was the most unexpected production issue that you've had to overcome in a short amount of time Chris? Unexpected. Hmm. I know my answer. The, the, if you want me to go. Yeah, if you've got an answer, 100%. Uh, I did a broadcast, a, a very one man army broadcast that was six cameras, six game feeds, and, and the game itself running off of my one machine, which, as I've previously mentioned, has an old graphics card. It really, really struggled. But what was unexpected about this wasn't that the graphics were failing. That was surprisingly good. Uh, what was failing was the memory at that point. And then in the memory failing, um, it pitch bended the audio. So the music that I had playing started to bend audio and it sounded like I was going from like normal, you know, to, to like Halloween, right? It oh was, it was, and I had no control over it, you know, and it, you, you, you couldn't have recreated it ever again. You know, it was literally, I don't know what was wrong. And the way I fixed it was to stop broadcasting. <laughs> um, no, 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 I didn't. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, just, I just turned off a lot of the stuff. Basically, I was overworking the machine um, and I needed multiple machines really to have, to have operated like that. It was pretty silly of me to try and do so many or so much through one. I've, I've done that 100% where you have entirely too much going through one machine. Um, my old streaming PC, 
officially decommissioned now and given to my housemate um had that with a very large event that we were trying to run off just that well we i had a some assistance from Elliot, other elliot's machine but it was not nearly enough and i, I hate that i think <laughs> this is very specific but my most unexpected issue that i had was one that took me like three or four games of rocket league to realize what was happening the feed was just from the game was just bugging out entirely and i had absolutely no idea what was going on so i would be in the game and the camera would start spinning about for no reason and occasionally no idea why it would stop and go back to normal and i'm like is the game broken how, how do i fix this I, I don't know what's going on i had a controller plugged in and i didn't realize <laughs> i had a controller plugged in i was literally about to say was it is it like a bit of dirt underneath your mouse laser or you know i was gonna say there must have been something coordinating a pointer there I had a dodgy, it wasn't just a controller, because a controller wouldn't have done that. It would have just been sitting there. I had a, do it's actually the one I play Rocket League with. I have a dodgy controller where one of the buttons is perma stuck down. And that doesn't affect my ability to play the game because I've just, I don't use that button in the game. And so I've removed it from everything. I just, that, it doesn't do anything, except it does do stuff in the spectator <laughs> version of the game. <laughs> and so. <laughs> When I was, whenever I was tapped into the game, it would go haywire, and I had no idea why. And it's because this button was occasionally pressing itself. And I, yeah, I got so confused. See, that's what that's what you like, right? When you ask a question in a quickfire round, what how did what was this what was this weird problem, and how did you solve it? And both of us solved it, I think. To a degree. I solved yeah. mine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I you... bought some new memory. It now works fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Asshole. Next question comes from Queen Bee Senpai, otherwise known as Shubs to many people. Um, here's a question from her. Technical issues happen. How do you overcome them in high-pressure environments? You always take a breath. There will be a problem. Esport, if I, I assume all production will always have an issue. Do not try to panic fix it. That will cause more issues nine times out of ten. If you sit down, take an extra five seconds just to think things through before rushing to jump on it, jump on the machine, try and be like, I, this is what this is going to do, because that will end up causing more issues. The amount of times that when I was growing, I would fix an issue by moving X, Y, and Z to the next place, and it'll all be sorted. That will break three things down the line, and you'll have more issues later. If you take a second and fix it a little bit slower than you maybe would have done, Twitch chat is only going <laughs> to rinse you for the one time instead of the four times. Um, that's, that's actually a really it, good answer. It's 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 easy to say just take a breath and calm down, but as I've done this more and more, I've become a lot more relaxed about issues. I, th I think not taking every issue to be the end of the world is really important. Yeah, level headed and cool under pressure is yeah, kind of key when you're dealing with problems. Um, there's no there's not there's nothing really. Can you, can you just give me like the 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 question just very briefly. Yeah, so uh, how do you overcome technical issues in high pressure environments? Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're gonna happen, right? Like the, the, the way to overcome them is to know what you're doing, right? By prepping lots, by testing lots. And then when something goes wrong, you know probably what's gone wrong. If there was something that you weren't sure of when you were building it, or something that you felt was maybe stretching your limits in terms of competence, like for example, I don't know, you, maybe you were running a replay up for the first time and you've never done it, right? And you're like, okay, this, you know, this is a little bit out of my comfort zone. Something starts to go wrong there. Don't panic, right? It's fine, right? You can, you can just take a breath. Um, either just scrap the, scrap the segment, scrap the element if it's, if it's out, of your, um, uh, out of your competence range, or you can try and you know, troubleshoot and solve it. It doesn't matter if it's going to take you, you know, four or five minutes. I had, I had a stream... Um, in my very early days where I, I had uh, casters, uh, went to cams, and they had no audio. They couldn't speak for about three minutes. And I was like, I can fix this. Three minutes is a long time for three people to be on camera, not being able to say any words. Now, for about the first 90 seconds of that, they didn't even know they were muted. So they were just talking away like this, da -da -da, you know, presenting the show. And I'm like, right, guys, I can't fix this problem. I'm telling you right now. I'm trying to fix it. I ended up going to break. Okay. 
the problem was something very silly, very small, you know, but the casters took that on on the chin. You know, they were like getting pen and paper and like holding up messages <laughs> to Twitch chat, like we're coming back soon, you know, like things like that. They, and they made it entertaining for the 90 seconds that I couldn't, you know, I thought I was going to be able to fix it in. Unfortunately, I had to go to break and fix it off off air, but that's fine. We were back within about two or three minutes. And as soon as I took that pressure off by going to break, you know, there's the problem. I solved it straight away. And I was like, well, we didn't even need to go to break. I could have just thought about it. But because I was early in my, you know, I hadn't done that many broadcasts at the time. You know, it was quite a big problem <laughs> to have. Uh, and I was, you know, I was the only person doing it. I was under pressure. So that's how I resolved that one. I feel like I needed that advice last year. <laughs> I, did, I did some, um, I know different contexts, but I did some live TV production. Yeah. Um, and I was directing the gallery. And as soon as I directed the wrong thing and they queued up the wrong clip and everyone just starts panicking in the gallery, but I'm also panicking, even though I'm the person who should be staying quite calm. Um, yeah, I feel like I could have needed that sort of advice. To be honest, there's, there's always going to be the moment when you, when you crack, right? And that's, that's the moment you grow. Right, that's the moment you realise, right, like, it's, it's just a problem. You know, it happened, I can laugh about it now, and, you know, and now I know that I'll never have that problem again because I remember that moment and I fixed it, right, and I know how to fix it again now. I think those, those kind of, those pressure moments, and especially when it goes wrong and you don't, you know, do well under pressure, those are the things that teach you the most. You know, every, every opportunity like that is a learning opportunity, so. I know you can't control it, but also, well, I mean, you can a bit. But also having a good team around you, super important. If everyone's panicking, everyone's panicking, right? If one person panics, everyone might panic. But if you've got a solid team around you, it can be so easy to not. Like I was doing this event last year and I was out of my comfort zone, actually. I was uh, head admining a game and I, I could do that, but I hadn't before. Um, I'd been admin a lot of times, but I hadn't head admin. And everything was on fire because of me. Like it was only my fault <laughs> and everyone knew it was only my fault. And this dude, like where we were in the same room, this dude looks over at me and I expect to see just like hatred and he's just smiling. He's like chill. And I'm like, oh my God, this just relieves so much pressure and you can think for a second. And I, yeah, I'm never going to forget that guy. So our next question comes from just underscore ghoul. And they ask, how difficult is it to get into the esports industry? Mm. Um, the industry is more, yeah, the industry is quite difficult to pierce, but once you're in, it's pretty straightforward, I think. Um, I was very lucky. So I think luck plays a big part into it, but also just passion and effort. I did put in the hours, did put in the effort. Um, I did make sure I did my research and, you know, wore a suit to an interview. You know, it doesn't, just because it's eSports doesn't mean you turn up in your favourite team's jersey and, you know, your track suits. Um, you know, still treat it like a job. Give it your best, you know, be presentable, be smart, be on time, be reliable. Um, you know, show up when you say you're going to show up and that'll just get you more work, right? And that's that's what you want. I feel a very underrated ability in, in esports production specifically is competence. And if you can repeatedly show basic human competence, you'll actually get a really long way. Um, the amount of times that, like you said, people just turn up late or don't look very good because they haven't put any effort into themselves that day or they're, they're saying the wrong thing in the wrong place because they're not thinking about who they're talking to. It's it's very easy. I I feel to just be a fairly normal human being and get <laughs> quite far if you're if you're trying hard, if you're putting the passion in. Lovely. And our final question comes from uh, Puppy. That's with an E H. We know him. We love him. Um, what's your favourite moment from the There's Garfield? Oh, Garfield on cam. Garfield. Garfield doesn't have a question, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> But, Sorry, Puppy. You got you got overtaken by yeah, the cat. Oh, bless him. Um, what was your favourite moment from the British Esports Student Champs 2022 Finals LAN? Do you have a favourite moment that you'd like to share with us? Well, Chris would <laughs> if he turned up. 
My favorite moment was telling Elliot a week before that I had to bail on my plans because yeah. I had a better job coming. <laughs> <laughs> Production problems. Right, I'm, I'm down. You know what we were saying about being reliable? I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> In fairness to you, you had uh, a pretty amazing opportunity that I wouldn't have. I would. I would probably have taken myself if it was given to me. So um, that's fine. You know, yeah. But that you know, that's the problem that like, you got to deal with, and it's not just stuff that goes wrong on stage. Right? Okay. Right. We've got the biggest event of the year. It's happening next week, and I'm now 25% of my team less. So you know, those are the kind of problems you have to solve on a regular basis in production. Uh, my favorite part was probably overrunning by about four hours. Of that? Um, yeah, it's just, it's just fun to be you know, so far past the point where it's, re it's recoverable and, and everybody just stops caring. And it's not like, oh, what game's on? You know, it, wasn't that game supposed to start next? No, no, no. Everyone's just laughing at it like, at this point, right? It's like, okay, yeah, fine. Doesn't matter. You know, big deal. We're all here now. Everyone who's still here is here to the end. You know, we're, we're all going to die on this hill together. So for me, that kind of camaraderie of the venue as it as it overran was just like it was a bonding moment. And everybody, you know, it was hot because the air conditioning wasn't working. You know, it was like pe people were just in and out, you know, between the two venues. It was just all a bit stressful, all a bit hectic. But everyone there was still like, right, we're here. You know, it doesn't matter what happens. Like, it was like, you know, like Glastonbury when it chucks it down with rain. Like, the, the, everyone's just still out there watching the band. The band technicians are still trying to make all the amps work in the wet. You know, guitarists are still trying to play songs for people. And everyone is still there in the crowd supporting them. You know, so it's, for me, it was that kind of, it's all gone a bit, you know, hairy. It's really, really hot. Everyone's sweating, and uh, but we made it happen. Um, but probably the Overwatch finals, to be honest, just because they were they were so fantastically close, uh, brilliant to watch. Yeah, I love that. Actually, the Overwatch finals were pretty hype. I liked that a lot. Yeah, so Chris, what's your favorite moment of finals, Chris? Oh. I'm was so it not sorry. going? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it honestly sounds like it was amazing, and if it was any other dates, I'd have been there. It was so good. You you completely missed out all of it. No, it was really good. I um, it's my second finals, um, as like a full time member of staff. So it was just good to see everyone, but also, as Elliot said, just it was this sort of mania. We're like, we can't. There's nothing we can do anymore. We're just yeah. gonna keep going and see what happens. And we were there till ridiculous times, but. We yeah, I think we were fun. supposed to finish at seven, and we finished at about half past ten, I think, yeah. in the end. But, no, fun, we did re we did recover a bit of time, but yeah, that's one advice I think I'd give: prepare for late nights because nine times out of ten, you're you're going to be up late because of delays or whatever else. You've got to be prepared. And for early that. mornings. And early oh, mornings, yeah. 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 No sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, Bridie's given hers. Uh, well, actually, was that your favorite part? No. I think I think that question could be asked to both you and yeah. uh, Bryony there, Spiron. Especially since Chris wasn't there. That's true. Bryony, do you want to elaborate more on your answer? Do, was that your answer or? Um, partially. I think, I mean, it's sort of cliche, but being able to see the work colleagues again. And I completely lost my voice um, at last finals. And I was, fe I had some sort of cold um, it was horrible, but just being surrounded by nice people at half past six in the morning, sat in a venue eating a McDonald's, it, <laughs> it, it makes it better. It makes things better. Um, and so, yeah, just seeing everyone again was, was the best part. Yeah, I think mine almost kind of links to that in a little way. But so because you lost your voice, I had to step in and do some of your interviews. And I actually really, really enjoyed doing the interviews. Actually, that was one of my favorite parts, just being able to sit down and, and like speak to people. Uh, kind of, I guess, kind of like we do on the podcast, but more in that kind of intimate setting and be able to do that in person. I really, really enjoyed that actually. Uh, and so I quite like to maybe do a bit more of that again. So thank you, Bryony, for getting ill because it gave me a little opportunity that I wouldn't normally get. So you're yeah, very well. I really enjoyed it. So, Actually, oh, go on. the Sunderland, I know the answer you should have given because I know yeah. you've seen the clip. Uh, your your favourite thing about Chance Final definitely needs to have been Wax and Suit. Oh, that was <laughs> so good. <laughs> oh, 100%. Okay, if I have to give an answer, that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. Now, I wonder, well, we've got to get like a different colour this year. 
if he's coming back, we need to like get the rainbow going for like every year. Isn't if like... if he's not there, I'm not going. Well, he obviously doesn't feel that way about you last year. That's, he came without you. <laughs> it's a one way street, mate. I don't think I knew Wagson that well back then. He's oh. so good. I love Wagson so much. Yeah. Shout out to Wagson. So to finish off the podcast, as we always do. We're going to do a little segment called This or That. Now, the This or That this week um, literally came to me like last night. I was still thinking about what we could do. Um, but it comes from inspiration, mainly because I've been reading um, uh, a little manga called Solo Leveling. It's easily one of my favorite ones now. It's, it's so, so good. I'd recommend it to anyone who wants to read like manga and stuff. Solo Leveling is a great one. Um, it's all about this one character, but it's kind of set in like a fantasy world where uh similar to like world of warcraft you have like the different class types you have like the tanks the healers and the the, the damage like uh, classes and so spinning off of that a little bit this or that or the other this week special edition because you've got three choices out of the three do you have a preference of dps tank or healer elliot we're going to start with you this time um right When I first started playing games with this, that, or the other, I always used to play healer. So I have a nostalgic love for healing. I played a tank when I realized that my tanks were rubbish and I, I was better than them. So I learned how to tank. Um, so then I had a tank and a healer. And then I played DPS. And what more fun is doing the big numbers? There is none. DPS is my favorite by far and away. But I have a place in my heart for all three of those roles. If DPS is your answer, not a real prod. Either tank <laughs> or healer makes the most sense. Um, I'd definitely go healer. Um, I'm, yeah, That's the most support character there at the moment. I've been playing Valorant a lot at the moment. I'm a support character there. Um, I've always played the healer in basically anything. I'm, I'm malleable, mate. I'll play what the team needs me to be. The I've team the always needs them. support. The team always needs support. They always need healing. Sometimes they've got plenty of support and they need some. What front games runners. are you playing? The, the <laughs> tanks are worse than the healers. The uh, healer is always the problem. Why am I not being healed by the mercy? Come Final on. Final Fantasy fourteen was that. And actually I quite liked it because you could play all the classes without having to like make a brand new character. So it was I still need funny. to give that a go. I've got that like installed on my piece and I've still not booted it up yet. I still need to give that a go at some point. It's very good. Quite time consuming though, beware. Yeah, that's my problem. That and World, World of Warcraft already like killed yeah. like so much time. It's like, can I invest in another? Don't know. <laughs> yeah, puts you off a bit, doesn't it? Brandy, what about you? What do you think? There's only one right answer, and anyone who actually knows me knows that I play healer. Well, not exclusively anymore. I used to be like a one trick mercy, um, but I I did find love for Diva, and I do find love for playing tank at the moment. Just the same sort of thing Elliot said, like the tanks were bad, so I decided to do it myself. Yep. Um, but you can't play without a healer. The team won't work without a healer. And so, yeah, it's, it's the only right answer, really. Shout out to all the bad tanks out there. <laughs> Keep practicing. <laughs> oh, bless them. See, for me, I think it, it's interesting because normally, like if I think League of Legends, like I'm mid lane main, so DPS generally is what I pick. But when I think like back in my World of Warcraft days, I always tended to play tank, I think, more often than not. I don't know if it was just because I felt less pressure playing tank. It's like, oh, I just have to run in and make sure everyone's attacking me. And then I don't have to do anything else, really. <laughs> so I quite like the tank aspect in that, in that sense of just, maybe I'm one of these bad tanks. I don't know now. I'm going to have to think about that a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, 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 the kind of pressure-free... I feel like environment of being a tank of just being able to run in, knowing that hopefully everyone else is going to do their job and all you have to do is, is sit there and make sure everyone else is attacking you. I, I, I don't mind that at all. But in other games, generally, I think more often than not, it's it's DPS. But there you go. Stay strong, Sparrow. Stay strong. Pick up, the, <laughs> pick up those, those tanks who just run in and sit there. We like it. Right, well, that wraps up the podcast. Thank you so much, uh, Chris and Elliot, for coming on today. It's been a pleasure to have you both on. Um, Bryony, thank you again for being a wonderful co-host as always as well. Um, we, By the time this episode comes out, uh, I believe we'll be at the Bet Show. So if you are thinking about coming to Bet and you've not already signed up, I guess it might be too late because it's already kind of going on at the minute, but uh, come see us because we'll be there at Bet. Not only that, the following week, 
we're going to be Insomnia 70. So if you're around Insomnia 70, we're going to have the podcast back there. We're going to have show matches going on, all sorts of stuff that we've got planned on the British Esports side. So if you're considering going to Insomnia, uh, hopefully we can inspire you to come as well. Uh, once again, thank you so much, everyone, for, for tuning into the podcast. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.